Poco keeps the hits coming with another entry in their X line. This one, prioritizing speed past power. Hey, it's Joshua Vergara. What's going on, everybody? Here is a rundown on the newly announced Poco X3 GT. All right, we're going to start off with the unboxing. And of course, the box has the signature black and yellow colorway. On the box are designations to some of these features, like 5G connectivity, and of course on the side it says with easy access to the Google apps you use most. That's of course going to be through MIUI 12.5. Getting past the cover, we get to a flap that houses not only documentation, but also a lot of stickers so that you can show your Poco Pride. Underneath that is an accessory that is often provided in Poco boxes, which I love to see, and that is a clear case. Getting to the phone itself, the plastic that covers it shows off a few more of the key features, including the MediaTek Dimensity 1100, which is powering everything here, and then there is a 67 watt fast charger included in the box. It's one of those cool features that you would want to have in an affordable phone like this to charge up what is actually a pretty large 5000 mAh battery. Now that we actually got to the phone itself, one quick thing I'll mention about the design. I like the gray colorway that this phone comes in, that my unit came in actually, uh, but it is very fingerprint prone. You're going to see in a few shots during this video that there are still fingerprints on here, even though I'm doing my best to wipe the phone in between shots. There is of course the interesting camera bump. It's pretty obvious in terms of its design, uh, especially with the main sensor at the top, that 64 megapixel sensor being highlighted in silver. That main sensor is backed up by an 8 megapixel ultra wide and a 2 megapixel macro. We'll look at that camera a little bit more later. But once it gets to biometrics, we find that the fingerprint reader is actually embedded into the power button. It's not an in-display fingerprint reader. And after a few more settings are actually put into place, we finally get into the MIUI 12.5 software. This is familiar territory for anyone that might have used MIUI in the past. Uh, it still has a number of the tropes that personally I would want to see in my Android iterations. Like for example, Google Discover over on the left side so I can get easy access to my headlines. After that, swiping up on the app drawer, I do notice that there are a lot of extra applications on here that are already built in. This bloatware, if you want to call it that, is definitely something I will have to put some extra elbow grease in to remove. And another thing that I usually disable in MIUI is this portion at the top here where it tries to categorize all of the applications. I just need a simple app drawer where everything is alphabetical so I know exactly where to go. But we are getting a good look at this screen now, which is a 6.6 inch full HD plus what they call a dot display. It is an IPS panel, which means it's going to get plenty bright. Uh, Poco says that it can get up to 450 nits. But one of the main features of this display is its high refresh rate. It can get up to 120 hertz, which I go into the display settings and turn on right away. Another default setting in MIUI right now is having the notification shade come down when you swipe down from the left side. But if you swipe down from the right side of the top of the screen, uh, you will get the control center or the quick settings. Uh, this is yet another portion of MIUI that you might have to change for yourself if you are more used to, let's say, other ways of navigating this operating system. But that does go to show you just how much customization and how many options you do have in MIUI. Unfortunately, one thing is missing due to the fact that this is an IPS screen, and that is an always-on display. So far, given the specifications, this display is perfectly adequate. It's perfectly fine. I'm having a good time playing certain games on it already. There have been some new releases in the Google Play Store recently that I have been installing on my phones. Uh, but of course, we have some of the mainstays like Genshin Impact, which runs pretty well, even though I can't get over 60 frames per second in that game. But during one particular session, I didn't really notice any hiccups. As you can see in the settings page, I have everything set to max, even if I can't go above that 60 frame mark. Now the Dimensity 1100 processor that is in here is a recent release from MediaTek and it is a 6 nanometer process. Being a recent release, it should be able to provide just enough performance so that pretty much everybody will be able to get their everyday tasks done. And as you just saw, I was able to get some pretty good gaming done in Genshin Impact in particular. So pretty good performance along with the promise of 5G, which is what I'm already getting using my Google Fi data sim here in the phone and I can already see that 5G icon up there in the corner. Now the good screen and the good performance get backed up by pretty good sound. In this case, you get stereo speakers with obvious grills appearing on the bottom and the top of the device. One thing I did notice though is when playing games in landscape, I could end up covering at least the top speaker here because it is lower on the body when I have my hand right here. So my palm might actually be covering it. It's just something to keep in mind if you don't want to have that muffled sound coming out of the left side here. And then finally with the battery, it is a 5,000 milliamp hour unit, which is great to see. Poco usually does try to cram as much battery and really as much spec as they possibly can for less money. 
And that bargain kind of continues when you have the 67 watt turbo charger in the box included with the phone. That way you can top the phone up whenever you need to, like I did after I actually unboxed the device and played some games on it. The phone actually came to me at just below half battery to begin with. All right, and now here we are with the camera, starting off with the front-facing camera, which is a 16 megapixel shooter. Uh, it is not able to go over 1080p in terms of video recording, which is a bit of a bummer, but to be fair, this is pretty much what I expect from a phone at around this price point with this kind of specification. Uh, now, you're seeing the front-facing camera and it's doing a pretty decent job of stabilizing things. Um, I did earlier accidentally have the HDR on when recording on the front-facing camera, which actually turned the stabilization off, oddly enough. But in any case, here is a quick clip using that front-facing camera. Let me know what you think of the microphones, uh, what you're hearing right now via the audio. Uh, obviously, this may not be the best vlogging machine, but if it is the camera you have in your pocket, I will give it some credit. It has a pretty wide angle. I'm not stretching too far. So if you want to use that front-facing camera for things like social media and whatnot, I think you can. For the rear shooters, you get a main sensor at 64 megapixels, and that's probably the one you want to be shooting with the most to get the utmost quality. At around an f1.8 aperture, you can get some pretty decent depth of field with your shots uh, in both photos and videos. The ultra-wide camera actually dips all the way back down to 8 megapixels, and it sacrifices 4K video recording. These are two things that I would kind of expect, again, from a phone at this price point. Uh, but one annoying thing is that in the camera app, which for many people who have used Poco phones before will see all of the same modes and pretty much the same interface, you'll see that when you change between the main sensor and the ultra wide that the resolution will keep changing. So when you go back to the main sensor, you actually have to make sure that 4K is selected once again. And then the last thing that you would get here is the two megapixel macro camera and here are some macro shots. You let me know what you think. If you follow them at all, you know that Poco has really been hitting a stride, offering just very specific things with each new iteration of, in particular, their X line. And in the X3 GT, it's a very measured approach to the power or the speed that they want to give their users. With things like the MediaTek Dimensity 1100, which again, I expect to do a pretty good job with everyday tasks without really any stutter. And of course, it's going to look very smooth on that 120 hertz display. And of course, like with most smartphones now, no matter what the price point, being able to provide 5G is always a big deal. The cameras might not be super powerful, but they are pretty much in line with what we are seeing from plenty of other phones that are around this price point, with one main sensor that you're probably going to want to use the most compared to everything else. And of course, a 5,000 mAh battery is going to please pretty much anybody, especially on a phone that should be able to go the distance for all of those practical use cases and maybe a little bit of gaming and media consumption and more fun along the way. And so there you have it, a rundown on the Poco X3 GT, Poco's latest device, this time in the X line, adding a little bit more with each new iteration. Let me know what you think of this device in the comment sections down below and drop some likes on this video at the very least. Uh, for more on devices like this and beyond in the world of tech, make sure you subscribe to my channel. With all that said, I'm going to go ahead and call it on this one. Thank you so much for watching. Please take care of yourselves and each other and enjoy your tea, everybody. I didn't have any near me. <laughs>